I am Raquel Saez Rivera, the 2018-2019 Poet Laureate of Philadelphia. And I am going to start tonight's introduction. I will be reading a poem in Spanish and then English. And then I'm going to introduce these two incredible writers. How are we feeling? Yay. Cool, cool, cool. Um, this was a poem that was a request uh, for an anthology dedicated to Lucille Clifton on the anniversary of her birthday. And it begins with an epigraph written by Lucille. Si el mar se rompiera para Lucille Clifton en su cumpleaños. If the chain should break and crash against the decks and below the decks break the sides of the sea, or if the seas of cities should crash against each other and break the chains, if something should happen, Lucille Clifton. Porque algo debería darse y se dará. Si se rompiera el mar de tristeza, ese cartón mojado que gime contra el muro. Si pegara a llorar espuma, si el muro fuese el morro y las olas se hicieran trizas, recordando cuando eran gota, mujer bolsa marrón y mojada. Si Emayá se quitara de encima la gran frontera sin ser más cementerio de yolas o internado para tiburones. Si la ley Jones de repente diera contra los barcos llenos de bienes y violencia, si se personificaran las personas, si se mojara la madera, cartón contra sal y las cadenas fuesen periódico de ayer. Si todas las criaturas que el mar cría, los huracanes, los cocos perdidos, las aguas vivas, los piratas, la niña, la pinta y el cabrón de Colón se hundieran en su carne, sin tratados ni embustes, materia nueva. Si en un gran imaginario llamado océano tuviéramos la finura de enterrar el presidente, el gobernador, la junta, y en vez de entrar rompiendo diques, inundando comunidades, si los mares de las ciudades estallaran los unos contra los otros y rompieran las cadenas, si separara nuestra agua, caballo encabritado, que no encuentra río, nadie muerto, todos muriéndose, atropellar a los guardias, muchos muertos, muchos muriéndose, y cerrara los campos de concentración. Si le diera balas de maíz a las gallinas, rellenara techos con chalecos, tumbara el bosque de la cárcel federal reemplazando con losas antiguas en una fenómeno olimpia. Si acaso nuestros cuerpos, abriéndose en manos, se llenaran de otros cuerpos de agua, casados a piedra y el mar. Si estar roto fuese preludio al nuevo mundo. Si las islas fuesen lloriqueo petrificado, tatuaje terrestre de alguna diosa traicionada, si el mar huevo se quebrara, si el mar hueso se fracturara, si el mar vena sangrara sobre la tierra, si el mar boca nos hablara, diría tu nombre, Lucille, diría tus nombres, Lucille, 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 Lucille. Si tu nombre se rompiera, Lucille, Lucille, Lucille Clifton. If the sea should break for Lucille Clifton on her birthday, if the chain should break and crash against the decks, and below decks break the sides of the sea, or if the seas of cities should crash against each other and break the chains, if something should happen, Lucille Clifton. Because something should happen, and will give itself over to happening, if the sea should break from sadness, that wet cardboard that moans against the wall, if it started crying foam, if the wall was el morro, and the waves were shredded, recalling themselves as drop, wet brown bag of a woman. If Yemaya threw off the great border, no longer Yola Cemetery or internship for sharks. If the Jones Act suddenly crashed against ships full of goods and violences. If people were personified, if wood got wet cardboard against salt and chains were yesterday's paper. If all the creatures the sea raised, hurricanes, lost coconuts, jellyfish, Pirates, La Nina, La Pinta, and fucking Columbus sunk into their meat without treaties or lies, new matter. If in the great imaginary called ocean, we had manners enough to bury the president, the governor, the fiscal control board, and instead of entering, breaking dams, flooding communities, if the seas of cities should crash against each other and break the chains. If our water stood up, riled horse that finds no river, Nobody dead, everybody dying, would run over the cops, many dead, many dying, and close down the concentration camps. 
if they gave corn bullets to chickens, patched roofs with vests, knocked down that forest, the federal prison, replacing it with ancient tiles in a phenomenon Olympia, if perhaps our bodies, opening into brothers, would be filled by other bodies of water, married to rock and ocean, if being broken were prelude to the new world, if islands were a petrified cry fest, a terrestrial tattoo of some betrayed goddess, if the sea egg cracked, if the sea bone fractured, if the sea vein bled over the earth, if the sea mouth spoke to us, it would say your name, Lucille. It would say your names, Lucille, 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 Lucille. If your name should break, Lucille, Lucille Clifton. All right, cool. Um, I'm gonna give a little content warning. I'm sure that many of you already know Lori's work, so that is a content warning. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to talk uh, briefly about sexual assault in this, introduction, in this introduction, so if you're not in a place where you can hear about that, maybe you like take a moment, step outside. I have two Bs on my undergraduate record. The second I got because my French professor was homophobic. She would leave the women's restroom, run up to me, and vent that dykes were leaving their phone numbers scribbled on the stall walls. The first I got because I never showed up to my final exam. Because the professor invited me to his office and proceeded to tell me that my eyes were two dark rivers and that we had a special friendship no one would understand. I responded as I have so often responded to harassment in my life. I never went back to class. In Shout, Lori Hulse Anderson tells a strikingly similar story. She describes her excitement at getting an internship to study translation in Peru. Because she doesn't come from money, she decides to meet with the department head. She prepares all her notes and is ready to pitch why she should get the scholarship. But when she sits down, the department head proceeds to say they are lovers from centuries past and should therefore have sex. She leaves his office, does not get the scholarship, and instead of becoming a translator, becomes a linguist. She ponders a life she would have led as a translator, yet wonders if she didn't find another way to follow that dream by becoming a storyteller. When I was assaulted by a young activist who fought alongside me during the 2005 student strike, I ran away to New York into a new relationship far from old ties. When a racist professor harassed me my first year as a graduate student who had just moved to Philadelphia from San Juan, I didn't file a discrimination suit and said I took an independent study and never looked back. Years later, when I was raped by another poet at a writer's conference, I couldn't bring myself to name him. It felt bad. I was confused. I blocked his number. I made sure he had no way of reaching me. And still one day, a woman I'd never met sent me a message saying he was there with her, sending his regards. I've often wondered what life would look like if I shouted all the names of my abusers. I wondered how many doors it would have closed and how many other doors it would have opened. It took me a long time to forgive and understand the choices I've made. Maybe, like Halls Anderson, I found another way of being a translator, a way out of the labyrinth of patriarchal and colonial structures, despite the silences that have risen unexpe unexpectedly to block my way. Yet this book reminded me that it's still important when we can to break with the silences that will otherwise keep us awake at night. The poet dares to dream a future, writing, quote, I wanted a coffin made of wood from trees not yet planted. My appetite for time was growing. Much like one of the first books I fell in love with, Jimmy Santiago Baca's Healing Earthquakes, Shout has a narrative lyrical quality, a willingness to tell stories how they ask to be told rather than by imposing genre frameworks. It explores how intergenerational trauma trains us to be silent, how entire systems are built to protect those who abuse their power, and how intricate and complicated systems of grief, guilt, and forgiveness can be. Much like Latin American testimoniales, it holds true to the belief that in telling our stories and listening to the stories of others, we free something in ourselves, something that has no expiration date, no set temporality. Just as trauma is time out of joint, so healing is time with no name, anonymous time. These stories allow us to travel back to the wound that screams, that asks us to listen attentively, gently, and with an open heart, with, quote, sipped bitterness and shared crumbs. 
Gabi Rivera's novel has a related but different story to tell. In the letter that opens, Juliet takes a breath, the main character, Juliet Milagros Palante, writes to the white feminist writer, Harlow Brisbane, and explains, quote, feminism, I'm new, I'm new to it. The word still sounds weird and wrong. Too white, too structured, too foreign, something I can't claim. I wish there was another word for it. Maybe I need to make one up. My mom is totally a feminist, but she never uses that word, end quote. This letter sets the tone for a novel that not only do I wish I had read as a teenager and young adult, but it has also helped me navigate the complicated feelings that have come up during my last months in Philadelphia before I moved back to Puerto Rico. Juliet Takes a Breath is about what queer Latinx theorist Jose Esteban Munoz called disidentification. A little theory in there. Juliet lives in a world in which a queer brown boricua from the Bronx doesn't see people who look or act quite like her. In her family, community, school, on television, and novels, Juliet navigates life through disidentification. Munoz writes, and I quote, it's like a nice long chunk of theory, so you're going to need a lot of Disidentific Disidentification is about recycling and rethinking encoded meaning. The process of disidentification scrambles and reconstructs the encoded message of a cultural text in a fashion that both exposes the encoded message's universalizing and exclusionary machinations and recruits its workings to account for, include, and empower minority identities and identifications. Thus, disidentification is a step further than cracking open the code of the majority. It proceeds to use this code as raw material for representing a disempowered politics or positionality that has been rendered unthinkable by the dominant culture, end quote. But part of what makes this novel the best is that Juliet gets to directly engage with Harlow, the person that wrote the book that Juliet has repurposed and adapted to her own context. And she gets to see the limits of disidentification and the need for her to write her own story one that makes spaces for brown, queer identification no longer mediated by strategic rewritings of a white canon. Juliet, named by her mother after Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, seeks mentorship from Harlow, whose name is one letter away from Marlowe, or Christopher Marlowe, the playwright whose, his whose history with Shakespeare has been the subject of endless debate in many an English department and one or two movies. This, of course, brings up questions of power, mentorship, labor, visibility, and is a pretty brilliant rewriting of these debates. No longer a question of distribution of power between two white canonical cis male writers, we are forced to look at power between two feminist queer women, one white, one boricua, one with access to money, free time, and cultural capital, one just starting to figure out how to navigate feeling like an outsider in her community and still wanting to be a part of it, still feeling like it is her community, it injects them with some actual weight. Juliet and Harlow's relationship points to many of the problems inherent in projects that propose feminist solidarity without examining other structures of power and privilege. It brings to the fore how brown labor is disguised as apprenticeship, how often young black and brown queers are tokenized by white critics and writers that refuse to give up their power, and how white cultural capital centralizes resources by creating a world which is self-referential, even in its self-critique. Throughout the novel, Juliet remains generous towards Harlow, even when Harlow betrays and disappoints her. She later wonders if this generosity is cowardice and tries to figure out how best to navigate white violence. But what's great is that this book isn't about whiteness, even when it's very critical of white queer spaces and practices. It is a novel about being brown in a world dominated by white institutions and canons, and also just about being brown, and also about spaces that aren't about whiteness at all, and also about brown love, and also about finding modes of love that are porous, honest, and deep as fuck. It's also about how nuestras madres never know how not to yell on the phone, and how no matter how many times we tell them, they think we can't hear. It's also about how for Boricua queers, our desires are always mediated by familia, by the shame, but also by the love our families gave us. I vibed with so many parts of this novel in unexpected ways. For example, Juliet narrates the following, and I quote, 
Leaving the Bronx was cause for celebration. Doing it by way of an internship with a published author and for college credits merited it all, an all your favorite foods dinner. No one in my family knew exactly where Portland, Oregon was. Anywhere north of the Bronx was upstate and outside of New York was considered over there somewhere. <laughs> but none of that mattered. Better to make food and have a send off for the first born granddaughter, me, Juliet Milagros Palante. In my case, this could easily be rewritten with a few words. Leaving Puerto Rico was cause for celebration. Doing it by way of a fellowship with an Ivy League university merited an all your favorite foods dinner. No one in my family knew exactly where Philadelphia, Pennsylvania was. Anywhere north of Puerto Rico was Los Nuyores, or Orlando. <laughs> and allá fuera, but none of that mattered. Better to make food and have a send off for the firstborn grandchild, me, Raquel Salas Rivera. And maybe this is the way those in the diaspora and those on the island have survived colonialism for so long. By making a world that sees all else as mysterious and to be celebrated, not because it is better than our world, but because one of ours was going off into it on an epic journey, an ambassador for our cause. Then there is the way the book navigates intimacy with white people. I thought I wasn't gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about that. <laughs> so much of Rivera's descriptions of Juliet's feelings hit me hard. The sense that something is wrong hit me hardest. Intimate interactions with white folk can feel like constant gaslighting, especially if race is the white elephant in the room. While navigating a relationship with her first girlfriend, Lainey, who is white, Juliet at some point observes that, quote, her heart felt far away from mine, like they were beating in different time zones or different dimensions of love, end quote. After their directions take, after their relationship takes a turn, Juliet realizes Lainey doesn't see her as someone she can take home to meet her parents. In other words, Lainey doesn't see her at all. As I read the book, I took notes, sometimes in the margins, sometimes in my trusty notes app on my iPhone. On September 21st at 11.30 a.m., two years after the anniversary of Hurricane Maria, it hit me that not a single one of the white people I had dated over the years made an effort to reach out and check in on me. But more than an angry reaction, this thought made me reflect on how often I doubted myself in interactions I knew were off, how racial violence often looks like the demand to move through the world using a language that isn't ours, a language that denies instinct, that assumes we aren't in dialogue with our ancestors, and that sees queerness or feminism as isolated, rather than acknowledging that queerness like mine, like Juliet's, was forged in el seno familiar, in our families, in our communities, where we slowly carved out a confused and beautiful queer joy for ourselves. In the best moments, this joy comes out full and whole like a vibration between QT Pac, a knowing, a touching, a world we made for us. In the worst moments, this joy is confusing, like when Juliet's mother expresses a love that is conditional in that it excludes her queerness, or when Harlow expresses a love that requires Juliet to see herself as a woman, but not as a brown woman. It feels like the world is fragmented. Juliet takes a breath, does not offer easy answers, not because it is, as we say in Puerto Rico, buscándole las cinco patas al gato, looking for the cat's fifth leg, but rather because it tells stories that are rarely told outside the circles where we build. When I went to the Miami Book Fair last year, I went to pick up my name tag, and the only name they could find was Gabi, the other Rivera. <laughs> Despite the fact that Rivera is one of the most common last names in Puerto Rico, here we were, the only two Riveras reading as authors at the Miami Book Fair. Navigating a world that isn't built for us is hard, and yet we do it every day and we kill it every time. These two next level authors share a desire to tell stories that no one else has told in quite that way. They do so selflessly and in the hopes that in telling these stories, we can build a world that responds to our needs, a just world, a generous world. I am excited to see them in conversation and honored I was given the chance to introduce them. And now I'm gonna read their official bios. All right, Let's see if I can handle that. Claro que no, ya, ya llegamos hasta aquí, you know, we, we got here, you know. I'm going to read the thing. 
Gabby Rivera's critically acclaimed debut novel, Juliet Takes a Breath, was called Fucking Outstanding by Roxanne Gay and will be published, or is published already, um, in 2019 by Penguin, right? Yeah, estamos bien. Gabby has also written in the Lumberjanes universe for Boom Studios, her latest short story, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, okay, but that, I'm following your lead, can be found in Victor Lavelle's recent anthology of People's Future of the United States. Gabby is currently working on their new novel, or their next novel? You gonna tell us about that tonight? No, I think there's an old bio. Oh, so it's an old bio, so it's, it's Juliet? Yeah, Juliet. Ah, oh, that's chévere. When not writing, Gabby speaks on her experiences as a queer Puerto Rican from the Bronx, an LGBTQ youth advocate, and the importance of centering joy in the narratives of Latinx people and people of color at events across the country. I'm not going to read this part. Laurie House Anderson is a New York Times bestselling author known for tackling tough subjects with humor and sensitivity. Two of her books, Speak and Chains, were National Book Award finalists, and Chains was also shortlisted for the United Kingdom's Carnegie Medal. She was selected by the American Library Association for the Margaret A. Edwards Award for her significant contribution to young adult literature. Lori has also been honored for her battles for intellectual freedom by the National Coalition Against Censorship and the National Council of Teachers of English. She is a member of Reigns National Leadership Council and frequently speaks about sexual violence. Please, please help me welcome these two incredible authors. Welcome to Philadelphia, my friend. Ooh, I love Philly. The Eagles yeah. won this week. Yay! Yeah! Eagles. No balls were dropped. <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess that's good. Not, not the important ones, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> it is a joy to have you here. Listen, it's a joy to look at your face. Ah, oh, thank you, baby. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we had a good time. We we met. We probably got to know each other a little bit in Texas a few months ago. Hi, Bevan. Hi, Bevan. <laughs> um, but would you please read? Uh, you have something you want to read from this amazing oh, yes, book? Can Listen, I just... it, can I read that open opening yes. letter, Juliet? Are y'all cool with that? Yeah. Okay. okay. I just want to make sure you all see this book <laughs> because this is it. This is this is like this was my favorite book of 2019. Whoa! No, for sure. And and it's just I got so many things to say, but you need to read. Yeah. First. <laughs> you need to buy Thank eight you. copies. Every yes. single one of you. Yes. 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 I don't have children, but I'm thinking of my children. Yes. And we need to feed the children. We I don't need to have. feed the children. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Um, I'm just going to read the opening letter. Sure. This is uh, Juliet is 19 years old. She's a baby dyke from the Bronx. She is about to come out. She is in love with a feminist book. And this is her letter to the author, who is a white lady. Um, and a loca, right, basically. This is Juliet's letter to her to kind of be like, can I help you with your next, next book? And she's an old white lady. Nah, I mean, you know, what's old? I'm 37. She's old. Yeah. She's old. <laughs> also, shout out to you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dear Harlow, hi. My name is Juliet Palante. I've been reading your book, Raging Flower, Empowering Your Pussy by Empowering Your Minds. No lie, I started reading it so that I can make people uncomfortable on the subway. I especially enjoyed whipping it out during impromptu sermons given by sour-faced old men on the number two train. It really amused me to watch men confront the word pussy in a context outside of their control, <laughs> like on the cover of some girl's pink book in pink letters. My grandmother calls me la sinvergüenza, <laughs> the one without shame, and she's motherfucking right. I'm always in it for the laughs. I don't ever really take anything seriously, but listen, I'm writing to you now because this book of yours, this magical labia manifesto, it's become my Bible. And, and it's definitely a reading from the book of white lady feminism, but there were moments, right? There were moments where I saw my round brown ass in your words, and I wanted more of that, Harlow. I wanted more representation, more acknowledgement, more room to breathe the same air as you. We are all women. We are all of the womb. It is in that essence of the moon that we share sisterhood. <laughs> you wrote that. What is that? I, I underlined that and I highlighted. Like, is that true? If you don't know my life and my struggle, how can we be sisters? 
Can a white lady like you even make room for me? Do I stand next to you and take up space? Or do I need to just push you out the way and claim all of this for myself so that I can have this earth, this block, these deep breaths? And I hope it's okay that I say this to you. Listen, my mother raised me right, and I don't mean any disrespect, but if you can question the patriarchy, then I can question you. And I mean, I don't really know how this feminism stuff works anyway, okay? I've only taken one women's studies class, and that was legit, because this really cute girl from my floor, she signed up for it. Like, the type of girl that made me lose my train of thought. I wanted to watch her eat strawberries while I made her a mixtape. You know that kind of girl? <laughs> So obviously I signed up for women's studies. <laughs> but like, don't ask me about feminism because I fell in love and then, you know, like Raquel said, feminism, I'm new to it. The word still sounds so weird, so wrong, too structured, too white, too foreign, something I can't claim. I wish there was another word for it. Maybe I need to make one up. See, my mom's totally a feminist, but she never uses that word. And still she molds my little brother's breakfast eggs into Ninja Turtles and pays all the bills in the house. She's this lady that never sleeps because she's working on her master's degree while raising my brother and me and balancing the whole family on her shoulders. That's a feminist, right? But that lady also still irons my dad's socks, so. I guess, what do you call that lady besides mom? I've got a secret. I think it's gonna kill me. And some nights I really pray that it does, that it kills me. How do I tell my parents that I'm gay? Gay sounds just as weird as feminist. How do you tell the people that breathe you into existence that you are the opposite of everything they've ever wanted you to be? And I know, right, I'm supposed to be ashamed of being gay, but recently I have had sex with girls and, wow, it's kind of fucking amazing. So I don't really feel any shame about it at all. Like, I'm kind of worried because how do I deal with everybody else's shame and everybody else's sadness? Sin vergüenza comes out. It's banished from familia. Next on primer impacto. <laughs> and you did this to me, Harlow. I wasn't going to come out. I was just going to be that family member that's gay and no one ever talks about it, even though everyone knows I share a bed with my roommate and she comes through on Thanksgiving, too. <laughs> but now everything's different. How am I supposed to be this honest? I know you're not a magic eight ball, right? You're just some lady that wrote a book. But I fall asleep with that book in my arms because words protect hearts, and I've got this ache in my chest that just won't go away. I read your book, Raging Flower, and now, now I dream of raised fists and solidarity marches led by matriarchs fueled by cafe con leche, where I can march alongside cigar-smoking donyas and black-powered dykes and all the world's weirdos, and no one is left out, and no one is living a lie. Is that the world that you live in? I read that you live in Portland, Oregon, but see, nobody from the Bronx really knows where Portland, Oregon is. Is it a real place? But see, a lot of people I know have never even left the Bronx. And I don't want to be like that. The Bronx cannot own me. You, you need to know that there isn't enough air to breathe here. I carry an inhaler for the days where I need more than my allotted share. And I need a break. And I know the problems in my hood are systemic. I know that my neighborhood is sanctioned and in a fully funded cycle of poverty. But let me tell you something, this place and the people here, they wear me down sometimes too. Some days it feels like we argue to be louder than the trains that rumble us home. Otherwise, our voices would be drowned out and then who would hear us? And I'm tired of graffiti being the only way to see someone's mark on the world. Mm. The world, what is the world? This block and maybe the next block and nothing else? There aren't even enough trees to absorb the chaos and breathe out some peace. Listen, Harlow, I will trade you pancakes for peace. I heard that you're writing another book and I can help you with that. Let me be your assistant or your protege or your official geek sidekick. I can do mad research. Seriously, some of my best friends are libraries. And if there's room in your world for a closeted Puerto Rican baby dyke from the Bronx, you should write me back. Everybody needs a hand, right? Punani power forever. Juliet Milagros Palante, P.S. How do you take your cafecito? That will help me decide if we're compatible or not. Ah. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> oh, my head and my heart are just exploding. Yeah, that's how I feel God, all the time. If we could give, <laughs> if we could give that opening letter <sighs> to every child in America, about what age? That, you know, whatever age they feel is right. Yes. Whatever age they feel is right. Because God, oh, Lord, do you have a gift. Uh, well. Thank you for sharing <laughs> it with that. I don't know. You, you, those buy 10 fucking copies of the book <laughs> all right <laughs> oh, um, wow. i hope there's a lot of educators in here you are the anointed you will go forth and southeastern pennsylvania and new jersey will take this book on in curriculum um this book will save lives yeah wow. this book is i know that it's already made a lot of kids go oh somebody sees me mm -hmm. wow who saw you um, oh my God, who saw me? I mean, when I was in college, my freshman year, uh, there was a professor, uh, a reverend, Professor Kelly Brown Douglas. <laughs> okay, gotcha, okay. Um, so Professor Kelly Brown Douglas is a black womanist theologian, right? And when I went to college, um, I was like not really sure what I wanted to do. Like I knew I was a writer and stuff, but I wasn't sure. And so as part of an elective, I took this class called Religion and Society. And Professor Douglas was like also the first African-American teacher that I had. Um, in your whole life? Wow. In my whole life, even though I went to school in the Bronx and like, I mean, I went to school in New York too, but I went to uh, all girls Catholic school in White Plains. And so mm. there was nobody. Um, and so right away I was just like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, someone in my neighborhood, you know what I mean? Like somebody, right? And Kelly also just like honed in on me and was like, you, I will take you under my wing. You are, like I see you. And so I was, I had trouble sometimes like uh, theory and academic language is like, was really hard for me to kind of like grasp. And so Kelly was also one of the first professors that was like, well, if you want to write a play about what you read, we can do that. Oh. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Kelly was one of the first ones to be like, this artistic thing that you do, this writing that you do, this like way that you see the world, like I know that this, these texts are new for you, and so if you're understanding it and you want to create something from it, let's work together and use that to also like, you know, give you your academic understandings, mm -hmm. you know? And so it was just like incredible. Yeah, Kelly, Kelly to this day is still very much like my mentor. Yeah. So yeah. I think she was the first person in that respect to see me as like, like a full human student creative wow. person. Yeah. And how old were you? 18. 18. Yeah, 18. God bless. So the goal is to make sure that every child gets seen, you know, the first day they're brought home. Yeah. And somebody sees, you know, you parents bringing a baby home in a cab or in the subway or something and just every oh just what, one of the things I love most about this book is this powerful I mean it's got everything first of all I, you should know I almost wet a pair of pants because of you because I waited too long to go to the bathroom because you know you're reading and you're reading and you're just like uh, uh, you start you're doing the chair bounce and, uh, and then I started laughing and I was like oh shit right that's how uh, that's the blurb I really want <laughs> Almost peed myself, Almost Lori peed Hall Sanderson. Sprinted to the bathroom. <laughs> oh, but but so but but that that is so balanced. And so you have like the funny, and the family, that love in the family, which makes her Juliet's um, fears and concerns and hesitation just so much more poignant. And just there's like all the feel. You made me 15 again. Because I was feeling all those feels with that intensity. I think that's one of, as adults, I think we sometimes, I know a lot of us will distance ourselves from emotions. We distance ourselves from memory. And that's a form of self-care, right? Because shit goes down, and if you don't get healed, um, you just have to kind of push back. And that's why a lot of adults look a little bit dead already, you know, because they've parts of their heart have died. 
And one of the glories of a book like this is that it reminds adults what that feels like when you're beginning, the, the beginning of your discovery. And it does it in such a, uh, a hopeful way. I, I, oh, glory, just glory, that's what this book is. So what was the writing process like, though? Oh my gosh, um, the writing process. Well, one thing I do want to say, though, is about like, what you were just saying, is that I really wanted uh, Juliet to be like as joyful and as in love with herself as possible, right? Like, I wanted her to start from a place of where like she totally is like in love with her thick body. She's in love with her curly hair and her brown skin. She's like in love with the world around her. I mean, terrified, right? right. Terrified, awkward, sweaty, messy, but still very much yeah. coming from this place where she is like whole inside mm. of her. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and bouncy and joyful, right? Because like we have the like tough Latina mm -hmm. narratives, right? Mm -hmm. the, the cop narrative or like, you know, you can go through all this struggle and you survive and it's like this oppression indie film, you know what I mean? Um, but with Juliet, I just kind of wanted her to like, you, you're rooting for her. Like she's, she's bouncing around in the story and trying to figure herself out. Um, and the writing process was like, this is like very autobiographical, right? So I did this at 19. I fell in love with a feminist book. And I also had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up, right? So when they were like, you need an internship to graduate college, I was like, mm, I should just go be gay somewhere. <laughs> um, so I did, right? Like, <laughs> the feminist writer was a lesbian, so I was like, cool, I'm gonna go be gay for the summer and research, and like, that was it. And like, what's funny is even when I was explaining that to my mom, she was like in the kitchen, like cooking, and she was like, what is this internship you're doing? Who is this lady? What is this book? It's about vaginas? Like, what is going on with you? Um, <laughs> Uh, and so I did that, I did that whole internship, right, and I worked with an author, and like, she didn't racialize me in the same way that Harlow does Juliet. Harlow is more like a combination of a plethora of white women that I've had to navigate. Um, but after the internship, a couple of, like maybe two years later, one of the writer folks that I knew was making an anthology and said, you should write about that. I haven't heard of too many Puerto Rican girls from the Bronx going and landing in like white Portland. Mm -hmm. And so that was like the beginning of Juliet and that was a short story. Um, and then it just, someone heard me read that short story and they were like, I will publish you if you turn that into a book. And I was like, oh, okay, Santa <laughs> Claus, like what is this, right? <laughs> um, so, so, okay, I'm, so we're telling this story. Okay. I guess we're telling this story. Um, and so, Okay, so I'm working TV film, right? So that means I'm a freelancer. And I'm gonna say why I was working TV film because like in my 20s, once I graduated college, I felt like where, what's gonna happen? How am I gonna get a job, right? My gender presentation was changing. I was getting to be like way more butch and not wanting to like hide it, not wanting to like come to work in like a skirt and dresses and all of these things. And that there was like automatic, almost like immediate like discrimination that I was facing, right? Like people were not wanting to, they would like see me come in and I just knew I wasn't getting the job, right? I would ask for applications and I would just, people were not, there was no room, like nobody, People like lesbians, but nobody is having the butch dykes over at the party, you know what I mean? They don't wanna hire you in the school, they didn't wanna hire me at the mall or the bank, and I was just like, little by little, seeing like the windows of my possibility of survival like closing all around me, and I had a college degree, and I was just like, what is this? I was having panic attacks all the time because like how I felt on the inside wasn't matching how I looked on the outside, right? And I was like, I I don't know where to go. And so TV film, right, TV film industry, there was a program in the city, they put me right in and they were like, we don't care what you look like, who you sleep with, as long as you show up before call time and do your work. And so I found a place, right? Like I found somewhere to work. And let me tell you, I was working 100 hour a week, no benefits, no nothing, because they don't give a shit if you're the production assistant, right? So Juliet, the possibility of writing this book, I was like, what else do I have? And what else do I have to lose? Mm. 
So I put all my energy into Juliet. I was getting ex exhausted on these film sets, right? Like, a bunch of men also, when I tried to do my own creative stuff on the film set world, I had men being like, well, if you didn't look like a dyke, maybe you would hi get hired in another way. If you were more attractive or you lost weight, we could get you in the writer's room. Like, fucked up stuff. And so with writing, it was mine. Writing was mine. Juliet was my story. I threw up index cards all over my mother's basement apartment. We, she painted a chalkboard wall downstairs in the, in, the, on, in the living room too, like for me. And that's where it all came together. And I just wrote my ass off. You wrote your space. Yeah, you wrote your own space. I thought a lot about geography because you, have, you start in the Bronx and then could there be a world more different than Portland? Do you know uh, Renee Watson? Yes. Oh, okay. Renee. Renee Watson has a, a new book out too. It's it's set in in she her character starts in Portland, yeah. um, a black girl who then goes back to visit family in Harlem. And Renee so, is from Portland, and yes, she always she tells me never forget that Portland was black first yeah. and indigenous, and and this like whiteness of it is like decades of horrific gentrification. And, yeah, and Renee. genocide. And genocide. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's a very interesting kind of cross. Their their planes cross yeah. over somewhere over Kansas, but then there's also these scenes in Miami with her cousin. Mm -hmm. Can you tell tell them about that? Yeah. Oh my gosh. So so there's like this myth, right? There's this myth that if you're like uh, black or Puerto Rican, Caribbean, Dominican, Afro Latino, if you're some kind of ethnic minority, and especially if you live in what's considered like a hood, that the only way that you can figure out your life or be somebody is to get out. You gotta get out of the, you gotta get out of the Bronx. You gotta get out of your neighborhood. You gotta better yourself somewhere else. You wanna be gay? You should get out. Go be where the white people are. That's where it's really gay. There's no gay here, you know. <laughs> you know, right? Like that. I mean, that's there's this mythology, right? This ideology that you gotta get out so that you can become somebody. And so that is kind of the where Juliet starts. Like she's all up in that. I gotta get out so I can be somebody. And so. I was definitely, like, by my second or third uh, draft edit of this book, like, I am, we, no. <laughs> Everything that she needs, she already has. Everything that she is comes from the people that have raised her. She's got ancestral magic in her. Like, we got to find it, you know? And so when they go to Miami in the book, it's because Juliet's family is, like, popping up and saying, hey, there's queerness here. There's queerness. Your tia in the 80s, the tia's like, I had a crush on the super's daughter and we were lovers for a summer. What's up with that, bitch? You know, like, welcome. And, you know, there's talk of, like, bisexuality in the family, too. And so Juliet is also realizing, oh, I'm not the only queer here. And a lot of times, especially with people of color, if you're in a movie or a TV show, you're, like, the only gay or the only queer and your girlfriend is white and you have no cousins or no family and you're just this, like, drop of brown, right? And I didn't want to do that. I, didn't, I, was, I was not going to do her like that. And so Miami is like where she finds out that there's queerness in her family. She's got a cousin named Ava who is like, if Juliet represents 2003, then Ava represents like 2019. Mm. Like she's just with it. She's got her, she knows what like the pronouns are. She knows about like social justice and like healing liberation and politics, you know? <laughs> and so... Juliet gets that too. She gets to experience in Miami what it means to be in a queer, trans, non-binary, POC only space for the first time. Um, and so that kind of brings it all like full, like fully home for her too. That there are all these different ways to be queer and yet like she, she, she's got it right here in herself and in her family. And I don't know why I keep doing this. Like I'm mixing something up here, but. Oh, yeah. I never, I'm, I never know what to do with my hands. <laughs> You're doing great. Hi. No, it, it, it felt to me like I, I almost want somebody to, 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 to set your book to music because there's different chord structures in the different sections of the book. This would be like, yeah, this could be something uh, amazing. I mean, it is something amazing. It's, extra, it's an extraordinary. I mean, I hope piece there's like some kid out there that turns it into some like a will. queer punk. Opera yeah, or something yeah, like that, that like, would be good. That would be cool for sure. <laughs> now, have you gotten? Uh, this is the end of uh, Band Book Week, 2019. Has has anybody pushed back yet? 
No, they they did all that with America Chavez. I think Juliet yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think right now she's still got a little bit of grace period, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, maybe some of the educators are like, not the educators, but maybe some of the people that are more conservative haven't really flipped the book. They haven't gotten the, the word yet. yet. Yeah. We'll make sure that they do. I was, you know, I was really like, I really want to write one of those books that like teenagers sneak slip to each other. You know, so I'm hoping this. I is think you her. did. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you did. <laughs> it's like it's uh, anybody for for those of you in, in in educational spaces or who care about kids, and if if you have a kid who's just gotten turned off to reading because the canon um, and the crappy books we make them read, and they're like they're not finding any anything that reflects them or or it looks interesting. Just that first page, that first paragraph, and 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 you've got them back. Oh, oh. So um, why did you set the book in 2003, though? One, because that's where, when it happened yeah. to me, right? Yeah. So there was that. And then also, the more I thought about it, I was like, why keep it there, right? It would probably make more sense to just have her in the, you know, in the present or whatever. But I stuck to 2003 because it was like pre-internet, right? Like right. in a sense, there was AOL, but it was like, it takes place like a year before Facebook even. Yeah. Yeah. And so to me, there's like a little more room for her like really naive moments yeah. because she doesn't have the ability to just like Google it or find a page or something like that. Like she really has no idea. Mm. Um, and so there, and then, so then there's the merging of like Ava's 2019 politics mm -hmm. and her knowing like, you know, what non-binary is and transgender and pronouns and all these things. And then Juliet's 2003. And I was like, well, how does this come together? And in my mind, I was like, well, in order for us to be talking about these things in 2019, there obviously had to be people talking and living and experiencing it and building that language in 2003. You know what I mean? So I was like, there in that, it makes sense for, for, for those two worlds. Um, and also 2003, right? Everyone, it's 2019 and everyone's like, oh my gosh, the world that we live in. And yeah, of course it's trash, right? But in 2003, we were like two years out of 9-11. Right? We were living in these color-coded insanities where it was like, today is orange terrorist threat. And like every day it was like, what the hell color threat are we having? Uh, Dick, T Dick Cheney had just started with his whole like Halliburton stuff. And so there was this privatization of the military. The Bush family took out sex education from the schools, which to me was them severing spiritual ties that kids have between themselves and their agency and their bodies. Don't let, I, they can't tell, you can't tell me otherwise that that wasn't meant to like, slice kids in half, you know what I mean? And so there is so much danger everywhere and it isn't just now. And so 2003, like, I, I really wanted to hold it in that place and be like, also we were queer here too, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, like I've been fighting the urge to ask you if you're gonna run for senator, I'm gonna stop fighting that <laughs> urge. <laughs> um, but, but it's exciting because I think one of the things that we're seeing now, um, uh, you know, in, in the trash of today, is we're seeing um, you, revolution is, is always led by the young. Every, because, because they're bold enough um, and they're angry enough and they haven't started getting dead in their eyes. Um, and they're smarter too. Like in a sense, well, especially compared things. to like, like when I, you know, the young folks that are protesting climate mm, change, mm -hmm. they're smarter than the men we have in government. It, what, that, like yeah, by far. Absolutely. I mean, I, it'd be really funny to see if we could get the men in government to take those high school tests that they have to take. <laughs> <laughs> like, do you mother suckers pass the regents exam? You know, like. <laughs> I like that. No, I like that. Um, but so, so, but for the kids of today, for the queer kids today, the kids who are like getting their hearts be beat fast when they think about talking to their parents or their mm -hmm. grandparents or whatever, um, how has it changed? What with the internet and the Google? And the Google. You know what's so funny? Um, when I was working with, uh, you know, I'm always working with LGBTQ youth to some capacity, um, but young, Young people, from what I understand, they're just, it's like the same, right? Like, yes, there's Google, yes, there's Instagram, yes, there's the internet, but at the same time, a lot of them are pissed. They're like, y'all got married and forgot about us. 
Y'all got married and had your own babies, and now those pathways to make queer houses and queer families, you close those off in the same way that you chose to live in gated communities. And so I hear that a lot, and I think that there's a real deep truth. Like, I see a lot of, like, white queers especially, they can, like, you know, and this isn't to, like, yes, go get married. Like, go have your love day, right? Like, go get fucking married. I don't care. But also, right, there used to be a time when we couldn't do that, so then we had to build our own families. And so I think there's a lot of queers in my generation that are like, oh, you know, they have Tumblr. And it's like, yeah, but Tumblr is not me and you. Tumblr is not giving them a plate of food. Tumblr is not helping them write their college essay, you know? So I think there's a lot of LGBTQ youth that are, like, pissed off and hurt and feel like there's a generation, especially of older dykes, who are so committed to genitalia-based feminism that they won't open themselves up to the new ways that young kids are exploring gender and identity. Um, and so I, when, I, when I'm around young folks, I just, like, you know, we're always like, you need mentorship. But mentorship goes both ways, right? So if I'm in mentorship with you, I'm also learning from you. You know what I mean? And so when I'm with young people, it's like, we just listen and we learn together and you gotta make room. And if you're a queer that's my age and you don't have ties to young people, you should really root in yourself and figure out a way to open up, you know? And they're good for the pushing too, right? Young kids, they're like, Gabby, yeah, okay, brown Puerto Rican Julia, but what's good with a disabled character? What's good with a non-binary character? How come you don't got no native characters in your stories? Where's the indigenous, you know? And like, you know, you can't do everything in one book, right? <laughs> but like, that push is so necessary, yeah. you know? Do you want to talk a little bit about your work with, with LGBTQ kids? Yeah, sure. We still good on... You got time? Yeah. yeah why don't you leave it and then we'll do the questions from the, from the audience. Okay, cool. 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 Okay, so think about your questions now so it doesn't get awkward when everybody's <laughs> like really quiet. <laughs> um, well... You know, when I left TV film work, I started working at the Dream Yard Project in the Bronx. So I was taking, because I was pissed. I was like, I'm helping these rich white guys make billion dollar TV shows, and they're not doing nothing for the neighborhood. They're not giving kids an end to the TV world. So I took my skills, and I went to Dream Yard, and I taught um, TV film, video, and documentary film production. And so we made documentaries about the Bronx. We did stop motion stuff. And you know, we started our first like GSA in the Art Center, too. Um, and I worked with uh, Glisten, which is an education nonprofit, and we did uh, National Student Council. And I will say that, like, if I had my way, that program would have been, like, we already had, like, 18 kids. We did a summit. We were teaching skills on how to, like, change policies in schools, get sex education, like, all this stuff. And I will say that if I could have just continued doing what I was doing the way that I wanted to do it, the way that the young people wanted to do it, like that program, I wish I could run a program like that on my own, right? Like have my own foundation and just do like a uplifting, joyful liberation retreat for like queer kids of color. Um, you just put that in the world. <laughs> you just put that Let's out. make it happen, y'all. That's right. Yep. Um, yeah, and just in general, you know, writing, telling stories and always trying to like working youth spaces and like now while I'm on tour, always trying to like make room that if there are like young kids like uh, having a GSA or a book club and they want me to come through to always try to like make space to do that. Yeah. I am so, so honored that you are a part of our community now. Wow. <laughs> you, we're so lucky. Um, this question's for Gabby. So I myself am a writer as well, but in terms of journalism, and I'm about to graduate this May from my journalism school. And it's daunting to think about the future because the newsrooms are kind of predominantly white still. So just want to know any advice you have for a young person of color Dyke, who's really yeah. trying to get, trying to navigate these predominantly white spaces in a field that you feel so passionately about. Burn them all down, yo. <laughs> Just burn them all down. Um, <laughs> okay, so if you're feeling wild and free, right, which you should feel every day if you can, you are free, you are brave, right? What stories do you want to write about? What's interesting to you? Go and write those stories. Go knock on people's doors. Go call people up. Go get all up in the business and do the journalism that you want your way. And then also network with folks that are doing journalism in that way. Like these white institutions of like climbing the ladder and working it up through the network, like that is so boring and it will exhaust you. And you can try to do that, right? I'm not saying don't do that. 
if if you're you know if you want to push through then do it but i think that like doing some independent journalism on your own telling stories your own way getting folks to to take on the stories that you've written pitching them to like online sources or you know any place that you know people that's the best place to start you know what i mean like cuz it really is um like this, where I am right now, like I didn't do any traditional route, right? Like I didn't pitch my book. Like, and I say it with that face because I hate rejection. And everybody's always like, well, if you wanna be a writer, get ready to be rejected a hundred million times. <laughs> that sucks, yo, you can reject your mom. Like I'm not here <laughs> for that, you know? Like that hurts. I was like, I would put something out into the world and like, you know, Hedgebrook or something like that, some kind of rich, fancy place that accepts writing, and I would always get rejected. And so I was like, man, I'm tired of that, and I don't want to stop writing. So I'm like, who am I going to write for? My friends, my mom, my people in my neighborhood, my cousins, people that know me and love me, all the people they tell you not to write for, right? Yeah. So that's where you, I think, should really like find your root in journalism, right? Like, do you like the stories on the news? Would you like them to look a different way? What does that look like to you? Make that. Also, Maria Najosa is a Latina journalist, and she's got her own Futuro Media Group. Mm. And she's always looking to connect with young Latinas and young people, queer people, to tell stories in new and fresh ways. So right now is a beautiful time to try to, to skip around those traditional white spaces and do something really cool. Yeah, you're welcome. Hit me Good up on luck. Instagram. Let's talk it through. <laughs> I just want to know how you came around to the term dyke, because I've been called dyke many times, and it's just always been something so hurtful. And I want to know how you say it with such pride. Yeah. Well, one, it feels really good, like, dyke! You know, it's just like, ah, there's a D and a Y and a K! You know, like, it just feels really good. And, I don't, you know, listen, like, I was called a dyke too, right? Usually by stupid boys that have no common sense about anything going on besides whatever their hormones are telling them to do, right? And so, I, you know, that to me, I, I, I don't know what kind of fortitude I had inside of me, but there was a point where I was just like, ah, oh, these, these rock-headed boys, I don't even care what you have to say to me anymore, right? And then with the term dyke, like I got, into it because I started hanging out with dykes in dyke communities, right? Like there's all sorts, but especially with the, there's a dyke march in New York City. And that march, unlike Pride, does not take corporate sponsorship. It does not get permission from the city to function. It exists as like a radical like push against like uh, controlling Pride, right? And it's a radical push to be like, look at women and femmes and non-binary folks like aligning together. And so to me that in that context, dyke is a really powerful word. Um, and to me it also kind of means like someone who is strong and tough and like maybe imagines womanhood in a different way, you know what I mean? And like someone that isn't like afraid to be like, I love women too, you know what I mean? Like have that at the forefront. And I think you gotta come to terms with the things that hurt you in your own way, maybe you can't ever reclaim that word. But like, you know, sometimes there's a lot of good power in it. I feel really powerful when I say it. And like, you know, other people are just terrible and who cares, you know? Um, so I wanted to ask you about kind of the part in which Juliet goes to visit Ava in Miami and like kind of Ava's questioning of Juliet's kind of cis-centric kind of stuff and and to talk a little bit more about that like opening up into like maybe like a queer space where you know transness was more kind of present that wasn't in a way where you know like in the portland scenes kind of wasn't present in those scenes you know and if you could talk a little bit about that sure. well oh boy let me scratch my head that's a really good question um so Juliet is like, you know, she's cisgender, right? So, but she doesn't know that yet, right? She just is like, I'm a girl, and I'm a girl that likes girls. And that's like the general understanding that I also had of myself and like gender and sexuality for a very long time, you know? Um, and so even like coming up in those dyke communities that I was telling you about, like it wasn't until a couple of years in that I was like, oh, y'all are saying weird things about like gender and what it means to be a woman. And so with Juliet, there's this, she doesn't know what it means to be transgender. She doesn't know that um, 
women can have all sorts of different types of genitalia, right? And so when she goes to Miami, um, her cousin Ava is like, you love this book by this feminist author who is essentially like just saying that women can only be people that have ovaries and vaginas? Like, what's going on with you, cousin? Like, wake up, you know what I mean? And Juliet is like, I don't understand. Like, I don't understand what you mean. Like, what did I do wrong? And so I wanted to do it between the cousins, right? Because there's like, uh, the labor there is balanced. So it's not a transgender random person in the book that is now educating Juliet, cisgender baby dyke, on what it means to be transgender. It is like her own cousin who's older, who has that emotional and educational understanding to offer her. And I feel like maybe sometimes we don't know where we can ask questions about stuff that we think we should understand and we feel terrible about not knowing. And I think in that particular space between them is a really good place for that safety and that, that, that understanding. And so in that, right, I also didn't want to try to define transgender, right, as a cis person. Um, and I didn't want Ava to do that. And so Ava just kind of opens up the conversation and offers some general guidelines about like, this is how folks are in their bodies in a way that you may not have understood or known about before. Um, and, you know, yeah, yeah, I wanted, I was like, could there, is there space for that conversation, right? And so that's what, that's what we were doing there. And Ava and Juliet kind of come to this understanding. Juliet is like, so all the ways that grandma and mommy are women, that's cool, right? But that's also not the barometer for everybody else to enter into womanhood. And so that, or to experience womanhood. And so that's kind of the like, good understanding place for, for, for Juliet and for Ava to kind of like have that conversation. I love your shirt, by the way. <laughs> You're the second person to say that today. Hey. $10 at Marshall's. Um, <laughs> my question is going back to a lot of the stuff that you've been saying. Well, first of all, I'm a, I came out late in life, so I'm welcome. a newbie. I'm, like a, I'm a gay youth, but yeah, at, welcome. at 53. <laughs> um, my question is, when I, when I came out, when I was in the community, um, I've noticed that in the gay community, there's a lot of self-segregation, and a lot of them, they go after each other, and they don't support each other. They stay in these fractured, different cliques. And it happens, like, if I'm from Detroit as well, I'm not from Philly, so, but we beat the Eagles last week, sorry. Um, anyway. Yeah, you um, say that here. You know? I know. <laughs> <laughs> but Peace and love. In our pride, in our pride parade, the, a lot of the homosexual gays and lesbians that were running the parade wanted to push the leather guys out. They didn't want us marching in the parade because it would scare away the white people. It would scare away the straight people. And so I'm wondering, are we part of our, an enemy to our own selves by doing this kind of stuff to ourselves in our own community? Should we come together as a queer community to support everyone or should we stay separated like this? Well, I think they should let leather daddies everywhere. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny, right? Because <laughs> I, I think it's so funny that there's, you know, like if you look at old videos of Sylvia Rivera, right? She's always talking about how like gays are trying to assimilate and they're trying to assimilate into this white world. And like a lot of folks will say that like gay men, gay white men, don't necessarily realize that they're oppressed as gays. What they realize is that they no longer have the access to white power and white privilege that was already going to be given to them. So that's kind of what seems to piss them off. And so I think when it comes to like, there's there's different there's a difference between marginalized groups maintaining like connection and community by having like sacred spaces for each other and like uh, kind of like a white body. LGBT trademark professional gays saying that this group can't be part of this or like feminist lesbian groups saying like trans women can't be part of this like that I think is the the disgusting part and that I think is also just like remnants of like white supremacy and colonization and like you know if you read a book there's this book called Queer Brown Voices 
and it came out in 2015. It's like a comp compilation of essays uh, from Latinx uh, LGBTQ activists from the 1950s and 60s, right? And it talks about all the ways that like uh, gay white men especially utilized bars as a way to keep black and Latino folks out. So they started carding at the bars not to check people's IDs like we do now, but to make sure that like undocumented folks and black people were not allowed in the space. And they also kind of made it unwelcoming for women as well too. And then white women did the same and so on and so forth, right? So there's just kind of like, it's less about like internalized fighting between the brown non-binaries and the leather daddies and more like, well, we kind of need to dismantle this whole system of patriarchal, heterosexist, white supremacy. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, we have to end, which is just really, really breaking my heart because I could listen to you talk for hours. Oh, God, I love you so much. <laughs> uh, the, the, the last thought that I want to share is that um, I think what you've created here is this, it's almost a perfect book because you have these lines of stories, and, it, and, and I was, I've just been thinking about all these different intersections that your characters occupy, but then there's also there's the spaces that she's creating for herself and the spaces that she's watching other people and the larger society creating for some people. And when you put together lines and spaces well, like you did, you wind up weaving a fabric of a whole new world and that's what you've done, my friend. Thank you. Thank hey, you very thank much. Thank you all. <laughs>